Now, in a change to its advertised program, here's The Late Show with Tracy McLeod. Tonight on The Late Show, why television is falling in love with its past. Questions of race from artist Adrian Piper. And a tribute to the man who took black America back to its roots, Alex Haley. Good evening. There was a time when television used to adopt a slightly apologetic tone about repeats and everyone knew that another chance to see really meant just more of the same old stuff. But repeats, seductively packaged and aggressively promoted, are proving to be one of TV's real growth areas. With BBC Two recently devoting two whole evenings to archive programmes and Channel 4 last week launching TV Heaven, a new series of recycled television, an evening in front of the box is starting to resemble a journey in the TARDIS. Doctor Who isn't the only time traveller. Others include Reginald Perrin, Eric and Ernie, and even Lady Penelope and Parker. So why are audiences finding old programmes so attractive? And why has television taken so long to recognise the riches that lay buried in its archives? The Late Show boldly went to find out. When we showed children's television last year, I showed the titles from Watch With Mother, not the actual programmes, just the titles, and a huge sigh went through the audience as Bill and Ben and Andy Pandy sort of flashed across the screen. <laughs> If you're not shedding tears watching uh, um, Elsie Tanner's wedding uh, during the season, you know, I'd be very surprised. It's, it's just, I watched it last night, I was in floods of tears, it was wonderful. There's a deep nostalgic pleasure, it's almost painful sometimes to see uh, an opening title sequence of, let's say, Criss Cross Quiz. You may not have seen it in 30 years, and suddenly there it is again. Um, and it gets you right there. Criss Cross Quiz. When I first saw a Dr. Finley episode in an archive package a couple of years back, I knew what to expect from the programme, roughly. What really got me, what got the juices flowing and got the goosebumps tingling, was the theme music. I hadn't heard it for 25 years, but I knew it note for note. Television's interest in its own past is at an all-time high. Our screens are filled with yesterday's programmes, from serial to sci-fi, from Dad's Army to This Is Your Life. John Mills, CBE, one of the most distinguished actors of our time. Tonight, this is your life. And there's the camera watching you. <laughs> Television began as a medium without a memory and with little concern for the future of its past. When one worked in live television, nobody took it seriously at all. It was just an ephemeral thing, a bit of a giggle, and you, you, you went on air and, and, and it went out, and that was the end of it, and, and you never bothered again, and you never thought anybody would ever want to hear about it again. And even when programmes were recorded, that didn't ensure their survival. A videotape. On it, a recording of a play, sound and vision, costing thousands to produce, and now... Gone forever. Lost. Though many classic episodes were lost, TV's low opinion of its own assets began to change in the late 70s when the Annan Committee urged broadcasters to adopt a proper archive policy. And pressure began to mount to get that archive on the air, with campaigning groups fighting for re-showings of favourite programmes. They got some of what they wanted when Channel 4 began. The showing of archive programmes from cult TV to drama classics was part of its remit. 
Meanwhile, the BBC's Watch with Mother video sold an unexpected half million copies. National film theatre screenings of vintage TV were packed out. Broadcasters began to realise the size of the audience for archive. I think people within television saw that we were putting together seasons of old TV, that we were getting large audiences for them, the press was interested, and therefore television itself began looking at its back catalogue and thinking of what they could do with some of the material which was just lying on the shelves. Soon, television was doing more than simply re-screening. The archive became the raw material from which increasingly sophisticated compilations were fashioned. For one night only, Channel 4 offers you 1,001 nights. Yes, that's right. 1,001 nights of British television, brought to you in handy, bite-sized chunks. This is direct television from the studios at Alexander Palace. And now you're going to see and hear someone you know well. Good evening. It's 1936, and this is the BBC, broadcasting the first television service in the world. The BBC devoted whole days to archive programmes. BBC Two has rummaged through the archives to put together over 12 hours of vintage programmes from Christmas's past to create the perfect television Christmas. There's a lot of television around, a lot of channels. You have to impress what you're doing on the minds of the viewer. And one way of doing that is to disrupt the schedule, to take over the schedule. Uh, and the other thing is that, I suppose, in doing things like Lime Grove, what we're trying to do is say this is very important. This is something that we haven't taken enough care to recognise. Something in, about television, television's past, that we're, we're putting on the map. This kind of scheduling has performed well in the ratings for both Channel 4 and BBC Two. But what draws the audiences in? Is it a collective nostalgia? TV was watched by far more people, of course, 20 or so years ago. There were fewer channels. People watched the same programmes more, and it was much more in the collective consciousness. In people talked about things the next day, and everybody probably would have watched the same programmes, whereas now we're much more fragmented as an audience. And sometimes, you know, you walk into the office and say, did you see this last night? And everybody else had watched you know, three different programs. All my doubts and indecisions and fears are gone, like, like a child's bad dream. I never thought it could happen, but it has. I'm deeply in love. Oceans deep. It's a chance to retreat to a time uh, when there was so little television that it has all kinds of wider associations about your life and the period that, that, that today doesn't. For those of you who chose Jason, we'll be sending Blue Peter badges, and we'd like to thank all the rest of you who've uh, sent in jolly good names. Television generations turn over more quickly than, than generations in, in real life, and you place yourself by according to uh, you know, which Blue Peter presenters you uh, you tuned into. Uh, I mean, some people in, in Britain are the Valerie Singleton, uh, John Noakes generation. For, for others, they're the Leslie Judd uh, generation. These things come over uh, pretty quickly. You know, uh, you, you know, some guys get terribly excited about the flowerpot men, but the flowerpot men don't mean a damn thing if you're part of the Hector's house generation. I'm just big old Hector, the diplomat. I'm rather con confused, and I think the program programmers are rather confused about what precisely their motivations are in putting on all this old TV. Is it simply to celebrate kitsch and to um, be nostalgic and to be cultish, um, or is it to create some re critical reevaluation of old television? I think watching old television is like watching old movies. You don't look at an old movie just as a sort of serious work of art or just as a piece of, of uh, culture of kitsch. Quite often there are moments of fantastic art or artifice and there are rather risible or, 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 or amusing moments. In other words, that I, I don't think we should divide the audience into sort of serious on the one hand and...